absolutely loved that. So that's going to be a tough act to follow. I did not bring my ukulele. I'm really sorry. Um, but I'll, I'll see what I can do to keep you guys awake as well. Um, I wanted to start out with a brief introduction of myself. I know this conference tends to attract a lot of students, and I know when I was a student, it was very instructive to know what other people's career paths were, um, what took them where they ended up going. So, um, so I started my career as an intelligence analyst. I am an intel analyst by trade. Uh, so straight out of undergrad, I went into CIA, where I was an analyst looking at Russian space and then cyber threats, military space and cyber threats. Uh, so I was at CIA for 12 years, uh, which was great. And then I hopped over to IBM, where I also did intelligence analysis for four years. And then for the past year at IBM, I've been working in the X4 cyber range, where we put um, organizations through cyber crisis simulations and help them uh, test how they would respond to a cyber attack in the critical moment. And if you'll indulge me for just one moment, um, just for a minute and a half, I wanted to let my good friend Allison Ritter give you a quick tour of the cyber range in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is the IBM Security Command Center. My name is Allison Ritter, and I'm the Command Center's Creative Director. We are an elite team that help prepare our clients to perform at their best, even on their worst possible day. Our Command Center is a state-of-the-art security operations center that uses the latest threat intelligence to simulate cyber attacks for clients based on their industry and needs. The simulation is an immersive experience that is built to test their response to a cyber incident. On the day of the experience, clients come in and are oriented to the Command Center. Almost immediately after, the simulated breach begins. Command Center. The goal is to understand how the entire organization works together and how to support the Buffering problems. If we don't get all the way through, that's OK. I think she still gave you a good, um, a good taste. So, so that's the command center. If that looks at all cool uh, to you and interesting, feel free to get in touch with me, and I'm happy to chat about it. Um, but what I'm really here to talk about today is kind of a side project that I have been working on uh, that looks at how ransomware groups are rebranding. And um, in 2021, law enforcement worldwide accelerated its focus on ransomware threat actors. So this renewed emphasis likely spurred by cyber attacks on critical infrastructure and supply chain providers such as the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack in May 2021 and the attack on Kaseya in September 2021. So as a result of this focus, law enforcement teams worldwide um, conducted a number of arrests. So they arrested six members of the CLOP gang in June 2021 two operators connected to Revil in October 2021, a group associated with Locker Goga and Mega Cortex in October 21, and then in January 2022, the Russian Federal Security Service itself, which is known for going easy on ransomware actors, they arrested 14 operators associated with Revil ransomware groups. So facing this increased law enforcement activity, ransomware groups have been rebranding at an accelerated rate. Rebranding is when a ransomware gang changes the name of their group, the malware they use in ransomware attacks, and sometimes their infrastructure in an attempt to remake themselves and hide from law enforcement operations. According to the 2022 X-Force Threat Intelligence Index, the current average lifespan of a ransomware group is 17 months, after which it is likely to shut down, rebrand itself, or potentially shut down altogether. So, of course, law enforcement evasion is not the only reason that ransomware groups rebrand. Disagreements and factions within groups can lead to rebranding or splinters. Advances in malware, attack techniques, or public relations strategies might also prompt ransomware groups to rebrand and recreate their image with improved capabilities. But whatever the reason behind a rebrand, the implications of this trend are clear. That the ransomware groups are not going away, 
and the individuals behind this activity are likely to continue their trade even if under a different name. Thus, tracking and understanding ransomware rebrands can help us can help threat researchers, can help law enforcement, and potential ransomware victims better understand cybercriminal groups' tactics, techniques, and procedures, including procedures that are enduring or procedures that are in flux, anticipate ransom negotiation tactics, and even unravel the rebranding labyrinth to reveal the individuals behind it, including for law enforcement action. Because Ransomware groups are, for the most part, rebranding to evade law enforcement and mask their true identity. The rebranding process is, by definition, opaque, unclear, and usually debatable. These are not legitimate businesses releasing clear press statements. The company A will now be known as company B with a new logo. Rather, these are cyber criminal groups attempting to stay under the radar and confuse outside observers. Thus, the art of tracking ransomware rebrands is tedious and often uncertain, and confidence in the reality of a rebrand varies from group to group, and also tends to vary over time as more information is made available. As analysts collect additional evidence of a rebrand between groups over time, confidence in that rebrand may change. In addition, it is possible that security researchers or the press could become unwitting accomplices in rebranding. They can contribute to confusion by publicly declaring a rebrand when one has not truly occurred or mistakenly misattributing a new ransomware group as a rebrand of one to which it has no strong relation. This is a natural side effect of investigating a necessarily opaque maze of relationships. The more security researchers are aware of this tendency, the more likely it is that caution will prevail in researching and declaring rebrands and relationships. Here on this slide is a snippet of a press article about a Babook rebrand to payload bin, a rebrand that never actually happened, but which the ransomware group wanted researchers and the public to think had happened. So this is one example of how we can be unwitting accomplices in this. And we're gonna talk about more about Babook and Payload Bin in a minute. So to illustrate the complicated nature of rebranding, I'm going to walk you through three case studies, of three stories of actual ransomware rebrands that we're aware of, including the messy and the unclear details that reveal how these rebranding operations unfold and what they entail. For some of these rebranding sagas, the story is not over, and we will probably see more to come. Um, and their relationship to other groups is likely to evolve over time. So one example of this complicated nature is um, the relationship between Maze, Sekmet, and Egregor. The Maze ransomware group began operations in May 2019, establishing a strong business model that other groups would follow by creating a public name and shame website and contracting out ransomware in a ransomware as a service model, um, contracting out um, to affiliates that task of infiltrating victims, Mays realized a precedent setting level of success in its attacks. And then on November 1st, 2020, Mays announced that it was shut down, going to shut down, apparently in its prime, um, abruptly ending their campaign. Before Mays even shut down, however, the Egregor ransomware gang began operations in September 2020. And as security researchers began to compare the two strains, many were coming to the conclusion that Egregor was Mays's follow-on. Yet, if one looks closely at the code in Maze and Egregor Ransomware, the similarities are not as strong as other rebrands. And I have here a snippet of my research that I've done comparing these groups, um, some of the structured research that, we've, that I've been doing. So if anything, Egregor appeared to attract many Maze affiliates rather than bear resemblance to Maze's tactics, techniques, and their code and their style. 
Um, but a ransomware strain to which Egregor did bear strong resemblance was Sekhmet. So Sekhmet began operations in March 2020, four months after Maze, but maintained a lower profile and lower attack tempo when compared to Maze. While there are some code similarities between Maze and Sekhmet and Maze and Egregor, the code similarities between Sekhmet and Egregor are even more uncanny, suggesting that the same developers were behind both strains. On February 8, 2022, the decryption keys for Maze, Egregor, and Sekhmet were released together on a bleeping computer forum, suggesting a strong connection between all three groups. Recorded future analyst Alan Liska has noted that Maze, Egregor, and Sekhmet were always tied together. Each scene is a successor of the other. And then a flurry of arrests in February 2021 probably led to the demise of all three groups. Egregor officially announced it was shutting down that same month. Um, Sekhmet never made an announcement, but it has kind of disappeared. And then, of course, there's the more recent decryption key release in February of this year, which really probably dealt the final blow. So some researchers track a separate rebrand from Maze to Sekhmet and from Maze to Egregor, while others argue that Maze rebranded to Sekhmet and Sekhmet rebranded re to Egregor. In any case, the precise order of the rebrand is unclear, but a strong connection between all three groups is fairly apparent. So a second example is dark side to black matter to black cat. So the dark side ransomware group is probably most famous for its attack on Colonial Pipeline in May 2021. Intense law enforcement interest in this group following the attack and ostensibly law enforcement activity culminating in the seizure of 2.3 million in Bitcoin from a dark side address led to the disappearance of this group that same month, May 2021, after less than a year in operation. Two months later, a new group named Black Matter emerged. Similarities in encryption algorithms used by both DarkSide and Black Matter, including a custom Salsa 20 matrix used by DarkSide, led security researchers early on to conclude that Black Matter was a rebrand of DarkSide. In a subsequent interview with a Black Matter representative, however, the representative stated, we are familiar with the dark side team from working together in the past, but we are not them, although we are intimate with their ideas. Intelligence analyst confidence level on a rebrand from dark side to Black Matter has evolved over time in light of new and changing information. In um, however, at this time, and I'm showing some of my research here again, it appears that the similarities between ransomware code and encryption, ransomware notes, leak sites, and TTPs between the two groups supports a high confidence assessment in a rebrand, despite denials from the group. Not, not that we can trust everything a cyber criminal says, but, um, but that data point, um, the evidence goes against it. So Black Matter was also a short-lived ransomware group. However, they shut down in November 2021, again reportedly due to pressure from law enforcement. Since then, a new ransomware group named Alpha V or Black Cat appears to be a rebrand from Black Matter. Based on similarities in TTPs between the two groups, a forum post by a ransomware criminal announcing the rebrand, so this might be a case where we can um, trust what they might be saying just because it's backed by other evidence and a public interview in which a black cat representative reinforced suspicions that the group was a rebrand from Black Matter. Alf V Black Cat first appeared in November 2021 and Fin7, a group that X-Force Threat Intelligence tracks as ITG14, appears to be behind all three organizations based on our research as well as research of other security organizations. So, um, so a third example is BitPamer and its rebrands. So BitPamer began operations in June 2017. The initiative of ITG19, also known, that's how we track it. It's known by other groups as TA505 or even more commonly as Evil Core. This is a cyber criminal group that has existed since at least 2017, and in December 2019, the US Department of Treasury placed sanctions on this group, making it illegal for any US victims to pay a ransom for BitPayment ransomware attacks. 
obviously this created complications for the group and their business model. And in response, they rebranded. For this group in particular though, because of the sanctions, it is even more imperative that the actors behind this ransomware activity hide their true identity when compared to others so that they get paid. Um, thus, the group's rebranding his temp tempo has kept a fast pace and has been combined with occasional masquerading as other non-sanctioned ransomware groups. There are two potential splinters of BitPamer rebranding, um, one to Doppelpamer in June 2019 and one to Wasted Locker in May 2020. So BitPamer and Doppelpamer share significant overlaps in code, um, and the payment portals between the two groups also share similarities. However, it is still not fully clear whether the same threat actor group is behind BitPamer and Doppelpamer, as well as its follow-on grief. Similarly, the research community is divided on the wasted locker line of BitPamer re rebranding. So code analysis between ransomware strains suggests that wasted locker, which emerged in May 2020, two months after BitPamer shut down, evolved from BitPamer. In addition, there's significant code and technique overlap between wasted locker and Hades, which emerged in January 2021, Phoenix Locker, which emerged in April 2021, Payload Bin, which emerged in July 2021, and McCall Locker, which emerged in October 2021. So obviously this group rebrands quite frequently. As the groups behind these ransomware strains consistently evolve their TTPs and evasion techniques to circumvent law enforcement and sanctions, however, tr following this trail can be relatively difficult. Add to this the fact that the cyber criminal group, Evil Core, has frequently attempted to masquerade as other types of ransomware. In mid-2021, the group pretended that its new payload bin ransomware was actually a follow-on to Babook ransomware, confusing researchers and victims as to the um, ransomware lineage of payload bin, uh, if you remember that press snippet that I had earlier in the presentation. And then in December 2021, the group pretended to be Revil, a notorious and widespread ransomware group, and actually the one that X-Force um, incident response saw most frequently as we were helping uh, clients recover from ransomware attacks. And then in its latest plot twist, Evil Core, as of mid-2022, began operating as one of many affiliates distributing LockBit ransomware attempting to hide in the noise of non-sanctioned activity in order to evade sanctions, and also has been found behind Raspberry Robin attacks, which act as a precursor for ransomware. As more research on this group's evasion techniques unfold, confidence levels and understanding of these rebranding relationships is likely to evolve as well. So to wrap this all together, I'd like to address again why this even matters. How is knowing this stuff even helpful for the world? From a defense perspective, rebranding knowledge can inform incident response teams, can enable more effective, efficient response. If an organization is affected by a ransomware attack, knowing the past tactics, techniques, and procedures uh, used by the same actors provides an edge in defensive operations and in reconstitution. At the same time, from a research perspective, rebranding data can help with possible attribution of malicious activity. Long-term monitoring of ransomware actors across multiple rebrandings can give insight into their preferred targets, end goals, and operational objectives. This information, in turn, can enable more effective defense resource allocation and potential identification of the actors as well. Despite engaging in rebranding, ransomware actors maintain certain levels of institutional knowledge and habits, which is one reason why actors can quickly ramp up operations after a rebrand. However, these habits can also be used by sci savvy cybersecurity researchers and practitioners to identify and mitigate ransomware activity and data on rebranding enables easier identification of these trends as well. 
So unraveling the labyrinth of ransomware group rebrands is fraught with difficulties, but it does have many credible benefits as well, especially if understanding a rebrand can help you identify the individuals behind the activity and lead to actual law enforcement activity um, that stops the, stops the actions of that actor and also sends a message to others that there is increased risk associated with ransomware activity. So if any of this seems interesting to you, uh, if you'd like to become involved, let me know. I definitely see this as something that not one person, not one organization can do alone, but we as a security community need to be working together to track rebrands. So if you are a stu student looking for a capstone project and this seems interesting to you, let me know. I'd be happy to you know, share some of what I've done already and you can build on that. If you're a security researcher and intelligence analyst interested in joining as well, let me know. Um, I think it's important that we work together. The ransomware actors are working together. We need to work together as well uh, to combat this threat. So with that, I wanted to end there. I think we have about five minutes left if you have any questions about ransomware rebrands or anything else that I have brought up so far. So you mentioned the uh, some of the groups were taking, you know, credit for you know attacks or trying to pretend to be other groups. What would be like the motivation behind that, other than law enforcement um, evasion? Yeah, well, Evil Core likes to do that in particular, and that's because they are sanctioned. And so, if people know that it's Evil Core behind the activity, they will know it's illegal to pay them a ransom. Whereas they, if they can convincingly portray themselves um, as another threat group like Revil. Um, it, Revil is not sanctioned. Many U.S. victims have paid the ransom, and uh, so they would probably have confidence that they would get money for that. So it helps their business model to, uh, to you know, stay a step ahead of people. So I don't know if you've seen before the when people do forensics on like black blockchain uh, payments, they can like actually tra track Bitcoin wallets and like see and correlate those to businesses and other things. Which have is you ever awesome, seen? awesome research that needs to continue. Yeah, yes. so I'm wondering if you've ever seen um, that correlated to uh, like this topic where you can like connect uh, ransomware actors to themselves and them rebranding by just tracking their Bitcoin activity. Yeah, so, and admittedly, I'm not a cryptocurrency tracker, um, but I have uh, colleagues who work in that area, and I know that they definitely track rebrands very closely. Um, I mean, they want to identify wallets that belong to specific ransomware actors, right, ransomware groups, and as those groups change, they're going to want to find the new wallets as well. Uh, the truth is we don't know every wallet for every ransomware actor out there. Uh, and even if we do, that doesn't mean that we can stop the payments going through, but the more we know, the better. So yeah, I know this research is very pertinent to them as well, and they're wanting to keep up with rebrands and do it accurately also. Um, and when you can track money going to one specific individual, that helps as well. And I know law enforcement is interested in you know one individual, how much money have they specifically stolen, because that helps in prosecuting. So my question for you is kind of in regard to the Metabank hack in Australia when those ransomware actors hit. Do you view that um, more governments taking offensive action like the Australian government did is the key to solving this ransomware issue? Yeah, so the ransomware problem is tricky, right? Ransomware actors have been so successful, especially the past two or three years. How, how are they taking advantage of us? like this, how is this going forward? And I really think it, you know, we need to combat it on several different levels. My own personal opinion, it's when we get on top of cryptocurrency and can track that and make it transparent where the money's going that it's gonna stop. You know, there's a reason that ransom kidnappers switching suitcases on the street doesn't happen as frequently, because it, you know, you can see who's 
trading suitcases and it, it, you know when you're dealing with cash it's just harder to maintain anonymity um, so so I think I think that's gonna be the kicker if we can get on top of that but um, I think increased law enforcement action is really important you know in the US they've raised the ransomware issue up to the level of terrorism um, the, that we did after 9-11. I think that's great because I, I see it as that level of a threat. And But security needs to improve as well, right? We need to increase our defenses. We need to understand the TTPs that ransomware actors are using. We need to secure secure domain admin accounts and don't give access more than you need to and and you know it's all about domain admin they're trying to get to the domain admin accounts and so so you know security on one side greater law enforcement activity on another cryptocurrency tracking um and if nothing else just sending the message to ransomware actors that this is risky and this is not a good idea and there's more legitimate ways to earn money and come be a security researcher or whatever it is, you know. I will say um, hacktivism used to be huge. 2015, hacktivism anonymous was huge. That is not the case anymore. And law enforcement activity helped, um, and, and just the risk of the activity helped message that and change that whole trend. So hopefully that will happen with ransomware too. We'll see. All right, I think we're good. Thank you so much for your attention and questions and enjoy the rest of the conference.